What if you kill 12 people because your arrow goes askew? They have trouble with that. This is Free Thoughts. I'm Aaron Powell. And I'm Trevor Burris. Our guest today is Nancy Sherman. She's a distinguished university professor and professor of philosophy at Georgetown University. And she was also the inaugural distinguished chair in ethics at the United States Naval Academy. Professor Sherman is the author of a number of books on ancient and military ethics. Her latest is Stoic Wisdom, Ancient Lessons for Modern Resilience. Welcome to the show, Professor Sherman. Thank you so much, Aaron. It's a pleasure. Maybe the best way to start our conversation about Stoicism is for you to tell us the story of James Stockdale and the Hanoi Hilton. Sure. So James Stockdale was uh, an aviator, naval aviator, graduate of Annapolis of the Naval Academy. And uh, he found himself uh, on the USS Ticonderoga in the areas of the Mekong Delta and in near Saigon. He had been given as a mid-career gift, uh, you know, of, of education at Stanford, uh, a very slim volume of the handbook by Epictetus, sometimes known as the Enchiridion, meaning at hand. And he said to, uh, I think it was the Dean of the Humanities at that time, a guy named Reinhardt, um, what would a martini drinking, golf playing, naval aviator need with a book like that? It turns out he memorized it in his wardroom uh, on the Ticonderoga. And one fateful day in 1965, uh, he was in his, uh, I think a Skyhawk A2 flying over uh, North Vietnam and he was shot down. And he said to himself these very prescient words, uh, this is James Bond Stockdale leaving the world of technology, entering the world of Epictetus, maybe five years down there. Turned out to be seven and a half years. And upon uh, landing, if you can call it that, he was immediately pummeled uh, by the North Vietnamese. Um, he spent two and a half years in the Hanoi Hilton, the prison uh, of war camp uh, in North Vietnam. Um, and two in, uh, out of the seven and a half years, two and a half were in solitude, uh, solitary, and uh, much of that time in leg irons. So for him, Epictetus was salvation. And um, he, 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 I interviewed Stockdale several times um, toward the end of his life, post 9-11 in Coronado near San Diego, um, where he said it was um, a silver lining for him. It kind of got him through. He was also at the head of the chain of command, as they call it. And he um, realized it was his philosophy and not necessarily everyone else's, perhaps not, in including perhaps John McCain, who was down, down the corridor would, uh, glorify the situation. So James Bond Stockdale um, be becomes a bit of a hero in the military community. Not a bit. He's quite idealized uh, for bringing stoicism to uh, those who have to deal with a lot of deprivation, a lot of things they can't control, and in general, um, a, a Circumstances, whether it's your own chain of command or the enemy or even your fellow, um, your buddies um, who are doing things that you don't agree with, you don't like, but you kind of have to, as my young midshipman would say over and over again, we're stoic because we suck it up or we embrace the suck. It's not an elegant phrase, but it is one that you can hear in the academies. Well, that, that's what I was going to ask is that stoicism has a popular meaning if you're not talking about the philosophers you say oh he's you know got a stoic demeanor or something like that um so what is it about stoicism as a philosophy though that makes it useful for those situations rather than other types of philosophies so stoicism inherits or the stoics there are a lot of them greeks and romans spanning 400 to 500 years uh they inherit aristotle's predicament and that is that happiness, or better put, flourishing or thriving, what the Greeks call eudaimonia, is a, a combination of your virtue as 
say, the dominant or principal good, but how you also use that virtue given the external circumstances. And positive external circumstances, some prosperity, health rather than disease, children who outlive you, uh, children who are good, um, a, a political situation that isn't stifling. All these things for Aristotle are critical for the good life. The Stoics hold that this makes your life fragile or vulnerable, and they inherit not just Aristotle, but Socrates, as we know him through Plato. And Socrates' view is that virtue is sufficient for goodness. So they really run with that theme. They run with the idea that if you are good and if you really cultivate your virtue, you can learn to put a barrier of sorts between your goodness or your virtue, your virtuous character, your integrity, and all the crap outside that is the slings and arrows of fortune that could dismantle you in a certain way and ruin your chances for happiness. So they have incredible strategies. Now, these are the ancient Greek and Roman Stoics, not necessarily the ones my students were talking about when they say they're Stoic and suck it up. The ancient Greek and Romans have remarkable strategies for trying to put a buffer between you and the external world. Uh, I think they're some of their what modern Stoics tend to say life hacks can be used in a uh, more social and uh, and um, cooperative ways than is often picked up in the self help literature. Um, but that said, the Stoics really have. Uh, 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 an argument with Aristotle. He does leave things messy in the beginning of the Nicomachean Ethics about just what place these external goods have in our life and whether or not they'll derail you. He's honest, Aristotle. He says Priam probably uh, lost his shot at happiness when he lost all his sons so quickly in the Trojan War. That's a reversal of fortune that you can't really uh, undo. So the Stoics uh, pick up that, that morsel, and they are very good at making distinctions and drawing bright stripes and inventing new words, and they give a whole philosophy uh, to that idea. So for Aristotle, um, flourishing eudaimonia, happiness is is activity activity of the soul in accord with virtue. So it's a, it's an active thing. Is that the case for the Stoics, or is theirs more of just like a like a mental state? It's a great question. So Aristotle says that Plato got it wrong in thinking that happiness was possession of virtue. He makes it very clear it's not possession. It's activity of the psyche and the best part of our psyche. Soul and psyche is the, trans, uh, is the tr uh, translation for psuche. It's the best part of our psyche, and that is reason. And you can't actualize it without adequate external goods. It would be hard to be tortured on the rack and flourish. The Stoics don't go back to the old idea, it's just possession, something inside you. They do think that you are active in some ways with respect to your virtue or excellence, the real translation of the Greek word arete. The activity is striving or the activity is having uh making a choice or a selection they they sometimes use very technical language a preference a selection with regards to the things out there and you do your best to aim it correctly at the objectives you're searching for you may not get there the arrow may not hit the bullseye but if you are a perfectly skilled bozeman and you get it right in terms of your skill and art, or we might say your virtue, then that activity is what counts as your flourishing. Now, what if you kill 12 people because your arrow goes off, you know, goes askew? What if the consequences go awry? They have trouble with that. You know, that's, <laughs> it's a dispreferred event, but then they introduce a whole other set of, 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 um, mental habits 
to try and distance yourself in a certain way from the perturbance and disturbance of uh, disabling emotions that might ensue from things beyond your control. How does, in that sort of heyday of Stoicism, you know, it strikes me that there's a lot of commonalities to Buddhism, but Buddhism became a religion. Um, how was Stoic, how did Stoics relate to something that could be, would it, for some, was it something like a religion? Did it ever move in that direction for theories of the metaphysical or was it always just sort of rooted in something that would just be a philosophy? Well, the philosophy at the time flourishes uh, around the, you know, it's before the common era and after the common era. And so no surprise, the Romans are uh, Seneca, um, Cicero before him. He's not a Stoic, but he's one of our great expositors of the texts. Uh, uh, Epictetus, Marcus Aurelius are bumping up against uh, Judeo-Christian thought. And so Judeo-Christian thought absorbs a lot of this. Part of the reason that Stoicism seems so familiar to us, to founding fathers, maybe mothers of this country, to the Renaissance, to the Enlightenment, to Kant, is because it gets absorbed. This whole idea of uh, we share in reason, in the commonwealth of reason, that's a theme in Kant, uh, Immanuel Kant, um, 18th century German uh, Enlightenment figure who probably ran with the Stoics in the most uh, philosophical way. That is a theme that gets absorbed. Now, Kant makes it very clear that he's going to put the law, the divine law, you might say, that inside you. We're autonomous. We don't depend on a higher authority or a lower or the nature. But many internalize it as, uh, you know, the law of nature that the Stoics are talking about as organizing the world and is really uh, an embodiment of our reason. Many interpret this as God's law. And so Philo uh, of, of Alexandria, a Hellenized Jew who made entreaties to Caligula on behalf of the Jewish people in Alexandria, uh, has remarkable passages in his interpretation of Genesis that are straight out of the Stoics about how Abraham didn't really cry at the grave of Sarah in Hebron, if that's where it was. He went there to cry, but didn't give forth into tears. Sarah laughed. Did she laugh when she was told she'd have a child when she was a hundred? She didn't really laugh, says Philo. It was a, we would say, a nervous laugh. She caught herself just before she laughed. It was like a little shudder or titter. And she's on the way to being a real matriarch because that turns into, that will soon turn into divine joy. These are very stoic tropes that um, are in the air. I'm, you know, I don't know if he read Seneca, if Philo read Seneca or not, or what it, the common source for Seneca and Philo are, probably the Greeks, um, but they're reading the same stuff. And so when you ask, is it a religion? It got absorbed into many of the ways in which we read religion, the idea of we're children of God. This is a phrase you hear a lot in Marcus Aurelius. You sort of hear it in Epictetus. They would say we're children of Zeus. So we turn Zeus into a different kind of divine being. Uh, the, the idea of laws of nature, natural law, which Aquinas, of course, develops, that is a Stoic theme. So I'd say much of um, Judeo-Christian religion has certain elements because they're flourishing around the same time. Buddhism has a whole different path. And so its idea of letting go and of finding equanimity it's really by giving up a self, or at least minimizing the self. The Stoics never talk about minimizing the self. They are very busy um, uh, discursively talking to yourself, chastening yourself, making yourself 
better. There's no ego that fully disappears. It kind of gets absorbed into a larger world, but it's not about um, letting go of your ego, a very different kind of philosophy, even if both are seeking out equanimity. I'll just make one last point about the religion. You know, we all, uh, many of us um, tire of institutional religion, the dues you have to pay, or you don't like your rabbi, you don't like your priest, you don't like your minister, so let's do it on our own. Self-help becomes the way you have non-institutionalized religion, it seems these days. And the Stoics have become a bit of a secular religion um, for many, many seeking comfort and strength. Uh, the industry is a mega industry. Maybe not within institutional walls. Maybe even so. <laughs> I'm not sure where those walls are. You mentioned how technical the Stoics often are with just their terminology and their approach to things. And we've, we've touched a little bit on this, but maybe to help the conversation as we go forward, can you give us the the stoic definition exactly what they mean by both by virtue and reason given how prominent of a role both those play so virtue is something they simply inherit from the greek tradition the greek word is arete and it really means excellence and it could be excellence of anything from a chair to a human being when Cicero moves the Greek language into Latin and tries to keep as much philosophy as he can, erite or virtue, or excellence better, becomes virtus, V-I-R-T-U-S. And that's the word we hold on to. It has meaning often of virility, which some would not necessarily want to hold on to. Some say manly virtue. I disagree with that as a as a gloss. So so virtue is as old as uh, Socrates, we might say. It's been around. They just picked this up. It is a standard part of ancient ethics. Reasons also been around since then. We know that Plato talks about uh, educating reason till you become a philosopher king. Um, and we know that Aristotle says that reason is the best part of your soul, your psyche, but he's not quite sure how it blends with everything else. For the Stoics, it's the only part of your psyche. There's no parts, no, none of this three parts or Freud takes up Plato and says, you know, super ego, ego, id, not, no three parts, one part. It's unitary. And he, the phrase often used for reason is it's the, um, it's your hegemonic part. It's your hegemony, we would say. It's the ruling part of you. <laughs> it's often just referred to as, to as the hegemonicon, ta hegemonicon, the, the ruler in you. And that's a kind of old idea. But it pervades everything. You share it with Zeus, the cosmos. You share it in the world. That's the promise of our shared humanity through reason. But it also infuses and permeates. It actually is the stuff of emotions. Emotions really are forms of reason. They're um, perky or flat. They expand or they contract with your breath, your pneuma, the word for pneumonia, your, your soul breath, your psychic breath. But they are... Uh, but, but reason takes is um, polymorphous. It takes on all these shapes. And so when they talk about training emotions, regulating emotions that run away from you and don't listen to you, they're talking about trying to regulate your emotions that are, well, I'll use a contemporary term, cognitive appraisals of the world, how you see the world and how you frame it. And whether that leads to grabby behavior, where you run out to get something, impulsive behavior, or it leads to really aversive behavior, where you're, where, where panicky aversion. And so they reason in, in thinking about a stoic spin on it is something that they've inherited from way back, but they now make it the only thing the psyche is made up of. And 
Hence, I think they think we're extremely corrigible. We can be uh, reformed in, in very great ways. We know from so Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, they all had a, a theory of the self of human nature, but they also went into politics coming out of that. They, they, they politically theorized, starting with you know, man as a political animal for Aristotle. Um, do we get much of that with the Stoics? Do we, do we have anyone really start taking Stoicism and saying this is what it means for collective bodies known as governments or states or, or whatever you want to call them? Or do they just kind of keep it as a uh, more existential philosophy? Very good question. The first Stoic, who is Zeno of Kittium, probably somewhere in Cyprus now, uh, wrote a republic somewhat based on Plato's. And in that republic, we have a, a very, very inclusive polity. Women are part of the citizenship and they need to be. Uh, in some ways, Zeno inherits important political uh, and somewhat anti-conventional views from the cynics, a very colorful character, Diogenes the Cynic, who was somewhat skeptical of the narrow confines of current um, governments. And so he was sort of the, uh, the yippie of the day. He uh, says he's a citizen from everywhere and nowhere. He's a citizen of the cosmos, hence our word cosmopolitan. He's a world citizen and his, and he even um, burns coinage. You know, he defaced the coinage, defaced the monetary um, coinage of your country. So he's very much thinking about politics as global. He's doing his best to disrupt the order as he knows it, but it's political. It is very political and very outspoken. The Stoics inherit that. They are not, you know, they're on the march. You might say once we get to the Romans, they're into territorial expansion and they are very much against Aristotle's view that citizenship stops at the border and anything beyond the border is our folks that can't speak Greek. They say, ba, 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 hence they're barbarians and the Stoics expand the political borders outward to encompass the whole world. It may be part of a territorial quest. You know, I'm not a military historian, but certainly that's where you find Marcus Aurelius on the shores of the Danube in the, in the Germanic campaigns against uh, certain tribes. But they are experiencing a world that has moved outward. And since they hold on to the view that reason is our, uh, truest and only part of our psyche, anyone in this world has adequate reason to be um, part of this polity. So I'd say absolutely yes. For, unfortunately, we don't have much of Zeno left. It's in terrible bits and pieces. It's been reconstructed by some scholars, but it's not a tract we have. On the kind of practical side, Seneca is, of course, in a court. He's in a court led by Nero. He was banished for eight years prior to getting to that court by Claudius for an alleged uh, uh, adulterous relationship with Claudius's niece, I believe. Uh, and he spends eight years in Corsica, kind of writing this and that. It's not the Corsica that we know. It was not then the place you would visit now as a destination. Uh, uh, that said, he uh, his mom, Agrippino, works out that he's going to get back to Nero's court. And he does get back because he's the best writer of speeches, the finest man of letters in all of Rome. And she wants her young prince Nero to have that at his side. So he's in the court and much of his writing is the struggle for how you balance power with integrity. He doesn't always succeed. Um, and his plays are really about the polity, about how you might show mercy if you're, say, in the Trojan women, if you've won the war and you now have hostages of women and children. Can you show mercy? You should show mercy. 
um, and, and so forth. So the, uh, it is not just a household philosophy. It is a philosophy of politics. A few people stay clear of politics, and that would be Epictetus. You know, he was formerly enslaved. He has no interest in being in high places um, and so stays clear. Marcus Aurelius is not only, you know, he's a he's the emperor and a, and a supreme military leader. And he's writing his philosophy at night in his tent. So he's definitely talking about how can I be this amazing man with his huge gold effigies rolled out in chariots to enliven my troops as they face horrible terror out on the battlefield? And how can I remain humble and true to the values I cherish that aren't necessarily opulence and gold. In that context, then, where, if we can make such a comparison, where do we situate the Stoics on a spectrum from, say, like an individualist philosophy, which it seems like there's a strong element of that because uh, of the, the rejection of external goods? In including or the you know the necessity of external goods, including family, you know, like, um, and then on the other hand, like a communitarian view that you know Aristotle sometimes I think somewhat inaccurately gets placed in. Is there is this more of an individualist or more of a communitarian kind of approach to our position in the world and society? I think you can find elements of both. Uh, the thesis of my book, Stoic Wisdom, is that the self-help industry has capitalized on one element, and that is your best self. How do you find your best self? And how do you find your best self if you're stuck in the middle of a cube in Silicon Valley or, um, or your best self if you're on a battlefield like some of the folks I know? Um, or simply if you're going through rough times and you've tried Eastern philosophy, now you go through Western philosophy and it has the imprimatur of Western philosophy. So that for some is the right way to go. But I think the core and foundational elements of Stoicism are about a community. I don't want to call it communitarian or individualistic. I will just call it that I will give you Marcus's words. If you, he says, if you're on a battlefield and you see limbs, it's a, parts or limbs, same Greek word that he's writing, separated from the trunk, that is what a human being makes of herself when she cuts herself off from the whole. He must have have imprinted in his mind what he saw earlier in the day, although he's somewhat protected from it as the head of the chain of command, we might say, but the battlefield must have been horrific. And he's often talking about uh, ways in which we're silent workers working together. And if we don't work together, we don't understand how this world works. I mean, they view themselves as parts of a universe, granted, that works orderly, and you don't know it's order because you're not omniscient, but you're somehow working with the, uh, the best plan, the laws of nature. And so Seneca, for example, and I think some of his most magisterial writing, writes um, De Beneficis on benefits or on benefactions. And it's about the to and fro, the give and take of understanding what someone needs and giving that than that gift. You wouldn't give a country bumpkin a book, he says, and you wouldn't give someone a, a, a winter coat in the middle of summer. <laughs> and you don't give a gift with a furrowed brow or, you know, a supercilious glance. So emotional expression is part of it. And sort of understanding the uptake of your gifts and how you'll respond. It's a lot of attention to the other. I don't think it's just about self-help or self, a self journey. So they are writing a philosophy that has what's become popular life hacks for minimizing fear, minimizing fear of death. Um, I wouldn't say living forever, though that is one of the 
uh, the um, uh, tropes currently out there, biohacking to beat death. But they're actually facing fears that we face as individuals, but also collectively. So I think that's the best way to think about it. And I think some of the things that people pick up as life hacks, like pre-rehearse your evils, um, pre-rehearse the bads so that you're prepared and you're not caught off guard. Think about them in advance, you might say. Um, and also idea of um, putting some sort of stopgap between the quick impressions that come in and your impulsive responses as reactions to them whether it's about a threat or an insult, those are ways that we can think about changing our habits of mind about each other. You know, are we stereotyping that individual out there? Profiling, are we going fast in our response to them? Do we need to push the pause a little bit and respond differently? So I think all of what they say is about, uh, uh, you know, me, but more importantly, about us in creating what Seneca says in cultivating humanity. That's his rallying call over and over. Let us cultivate humanity. Marcus Aurelius is a, a fascinating figure, of course. And when you think of Roman emperors, you can kind of go down the Caligula, Nero, a Claudius path and be like, okay, these people were not exactly the best people or someone like Marcus Aurelius. Um, I was not actually aware until reading your book that it was, it was private journals. So he was not intending on writing a book, which, but do we know like how he got to this point? I mean, you know, that he was a philosopher writing in a tent, you know, on the Danube fighting Germanic tribes, like in terms of his, his influences who taught him. And then also, do we know how the book got out? I mean, maybe that's something lost to history, but how, how did that get out? If you were anyone in that period that, that Marcus Aurelius is raised, you had a tutor and your tutor would be steeped in stoicism. That wouldn't be Epicureanism or skepticism. It would be stoicism. That was just the court philosophy. And in an irony of history, he either was taught or somehow got his hands on a papyrus or manuscript of some sort of Epictetus. So he seems to know Epictetus. He also knows a lot of other things. He throws Heraclitus around all the time. So he seems to know pre-Socratics. So, and he says regularly, I'm not the smartest of guys. I wish I was smarter. I wish I was, everyone wants to be a philosopher in this world. <laughs> so he says, I want to be a philosopher, but I'm not, I, you know, I can't be, I'll settle for being a political animal. Um, so these, this is a um, a breviary of sorts. It's a almost like a religious breviary of of um, humbling himself, and maybe that's why General Mattis says he carries a tattered copy of of the Meditations in his rucksack when he's uh, in the battlefield. Because it's very humbling if you read it. it, it it's um, to my mother, I I thank her for this. To my grammarian for not catching all my grammatical mistakes or howlers. I mean, it's kind of funny, you know, I wish I was, this, um, uh, my students uh, remember me in this way. Um, that said, they're all over the place. I mean, I wouldn't really call him a philosopher. He's, he's distilling what a good student remembers from this lecture and that lecture and this lecture and that lecture. And he pops it all in. And, you know, I just taught this last week in my graduate seminar and my students said, please don't assign this again. <laughs> it's not systematic. It jumps all over the place. Um, there's no theory here. It's just, you know, witticisms, little pithy remarks. So um, I, I, I take that into consideration in developing a syllabus next year. <laughs> um, that said, it's written literally, the Greek is to, to myself or to oneself. So how does it come to be? I think probably 16th to 15th century, but I don't know the exact transmission of the text. I will say this. I was once in Geneva for a conference and I was at a museum and there was the first Latin translation 
of the Greek, which he, uh, as a well-educated uh, Roman, he was writing in the language of philosophy, which was Greek. And this was the first Latin translation mark. That was around, I thought, if I remember correctly, I may have this wrong, um, mid 16th century. So it get, I don't know who the person was that dubs it the meditations. Um, I, 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 I think I studied this at one point, but I can't remember the exact transmission. Um, but it, it, it becomes very much a, a leader's book. You know, I can't tell you how many people, um, that I know in the military cadre uh, high up who say, Oh, I don't know any philosophy. I don't read any philosophy. Ah, but I've read Marcus Aurelius twice this year and I do every year. It, it, it has that kind of value. You mentioned in passing a little earlier in our conversation um, that the idea that a lot of these stoic virtues get framed as masculine virtues. And I wanted to I wanted to pick up on that um, and ask you about the relationship between stoicism, as we understand it, and kind of conceptions of masculinity and, and in particular, the way that stoicism seems popular, not just in like the Silicon Valley life hacking crowd, but also in the like red pill online Reddit, like misogynist communities. And if that is, if there's something in stoicism or the stoic writers that lends itself to that kind of thing, or is this a, a misuse or misunderstanding of stoicism and, and why, I guess, why we see this connection, why it seems so popular in those communities? So there is, in general, I think, a misappropriation of Greco-Roman texts. It's got a long history. Uh, I don't study the transmission or the appropriation per se, but I have colleagues that do as part of their educational materials. Um, and we know that the Third Reich picked up on a lot of, of um ancient Greek ideas of masculinity and informing their views. Um, and uh, even in some of their pictures, you see the Parthenon and other sorts of uh, notions. Uh, Marcus Aurelius uh, on a horse, uh, one of the most amazing um, bronze and statues we have uh, still standing. People thought it was Constantine. That's probably why it wasn't torn down. It now ex is still in Rome. Um, that to many is sort of the lone cowboy, the, the, the male horseman, a Marlboro man of sorts, um, um, ruling the world. Why it's, um, the Greek and Roman Stoics were not themselves misogynists. Um, any historical text that you go to, and if you do textual work as I do and teach it, um, you uh, have to understand that it's contextualized in their time. You can't expect of them what you want of your own period. And so you have to be mindful of that. Um, and uh, just as we don't accept Aristotle as uh, Aristotle's views these days, that we are born slaves, that's a view of his. So similarly, if you find some of this stuff in uh, other texts, you know, you, you know, you understand the history and critique it. Why it's picked up by red pill, incels, the incelibate group and the like, and I've gone down that rabbit hole a bit, um, though um, that's not my primary preoccupation, I think is because uh, virtue as virile, the same root, root and the kind of masculine notion. And if you read many of the translations, they're not gonna be particularly inclusive. Um, and I recently read some comment of a very, you know, in a very benign way. Oh, she's only the second uh, woman I know writing about Stoicism. Well, that's a view. If I could tell you how many leading classical philosophers there are out there trained at Oxford and Cambridge and Harvard and Yale that are women, you know, it would be, you know, duh, where are you, where are you reading this? So I think some of it is simply a um, echoing of very prejudicial views and also an appropriation of a Western philosophy that 
doesn't have any air of Eastern stuff in it that might um, some might find corrupting. Musonius Rufus, a wonderful name, I think, and not well read because he wasn't translated much. And though there is a translation from the mid 70s, 1974, I think, um, talks very much about the fact that women are uh, are um, have virtue, capable of virtue, and should be educated as a result, meaning they have the capacity to learn. He is the teacher of Epictetus. Now, Epictetus doesn't give you much of that, but I think the other deal is that, you know, um, the Stoics are often read, read as um, athletics for the soul on the model of athletics in the gym. You know, that's a reason of the palestra is a reasonable um, uh, way of thinking about Greek philosophy, you know, and Plato tells you lots about um, naked wrestling of men in the gym. That's what they did in rubbing their bodies with, you know, with sand and oil and then sand, etc. So the idea of toughing it up with your mind in the way you tough it up with your body and forget about this weak feminine stuff is easy enough to pick up in Greek Roman philosophy, but it's poor. Plato's book five of the Republic says women should be guardians as well. And he says the fact that they can bear children is, is as, as irrelevant as the fact that a cobbler can have hair or be bald, <laughs> which I think nails the point. <laughs> it seems like, particularly over the last half decade or so, um, American politics and American political culture have been decidedly unstoic. Uh, and and a big a big part of this is like everyone seems angry all the time, just in general, but also at each other, um, and and particularly on social media. Uh, and is that for a stoic? Is that okay? Like, is is anger okay from a stoic perspective? Does is it one of those emotions that we should clamp down on or get away from, or does it have its uses? Another wonderful question. Anger for the Stoics is dangerous. It's a runaway emotion. It's one of the hardest emotions to regulate. And it's an emotion who's the, an emotion that inspires behavior that can be calamitous. Tyranny, bloodshed. If you want a list of all the horrors, not just uh, appearing on your face, what your face looks like when you're angry, but what happens in civilization when anger is unleashed, go to Seneca. There's a whole book on anger and why it's an emotion that should be highly regulated. And so a Stoic in many ways says that the, that while there are good forms of most of the emotions, fear, pleasure, uh, desire, not sure if there's a good form of anger, at, at least if it's a kind of distress that you feel, um, even if it has a kind of desire element that may be okay for, um, for um, making amendments. So I think they're far, while anger is misplaced in much of our political discourse, I couldn't agree with you more in our dealings with neighbors who may not be like us in general, how we conduct ourselves of late. And yes, in very unstoic ways. Nonetheless, there is a form of anger that is, I think, critical that needs to be resurrected. And that is what I would call righteous indignation, moral outrage, moral outcry. Um, but Aristotle seems to have left a place for this. Um, and maybe it was a kind of emotion that would, as he would put it, uh, is a response at the right time for the right reason in the right way to the right people. And here's an example in the book that really brought it home to me in a very profound way. When I was at the Naval Academy, it was 30 years after Vietnam, roughly. And the issue of Vietnam was coming up over and over. And I thought, maybe it's time to bring the person who stopped the My Lai massacre to the academy. And that was a young, young uh, 
warrant officer, helicopter pilot named Hugh Thompson. Hugh Thompson gave the order to the persons we later discovered were Lieutenant Callie and Captain Medina to stop the killing. He had been flying over the area we now know as Milai early in their day. There was absolutely no enemy action and no American response. Two hours later, after refueling, there was a ditch filled with wreathing bodies. And in his mind, he could not figure out what was going on, nor could the two people in his helicopter, Larry Colburn and a guy named Andriotti. Now, just um, two of those individuals are now deceased. When he stopped the plane and got out, he said to his sort of co-pilot, and that's Larry Colburn, if the GI shoot at me, shoot back. That order was incredibly controversial. But when he retold me this tale, he said in my office at Georgetown, almost tearful, he said, I was hot. I was so hot. I was going to stop and get down there no matter what. This is not what we Americans do. This is what the Nazis did. There was no way I was not going to intervene. And all his messages to the higher ups got garbled, probably deliberately. They didn't want to hear from this guy who was about to open arms on fellow Americans. But he stopped the, he stopped the, uh, the massacre. It could have been 300, 500 more killed that day. I think that's well-placed anger. I'm not sure he could have done what he did, which was very, very heroic. I mean, not in a self-serving way. He could have gotten himself killed then. He definitely put himself on the line. I'm not sure I know of what the moral motive would have been if it was cool and calm. I mean, he acted cool and calm, but he was feeling moral outrage. So I often pose this to my students as a question. What about that? Is that, what would the Stoics say to that? Did they leave room in their moral philosophy for the way in which we take care of not just ourselves, but others on who we see being harmed in the most horrific ways. What does progress look like in a stoic world? Because if, if to maybe overstate it, one of the goals of stoicism is to kind of be internally sufficient in the sense of not being like overly bothered by other things, by external goods and so on, um, except for maybe in these very acute instances that drive us to act does that does that effectively like sap the the desire or the desirability of of striving to make the world better in various ways whether that's you know technological or reform or whatever else i don't think so at all because i think moral progress which is one of their themes since we'll never be sages we'll just be progressors they say um, is about one, having emotions that are properly calibrated to things that matter out there. So they call them rational emotions or good emotions, but it's not, you're not sapped of the energy of emotions. You just kind of, it, you, you want things, but in a rational way and the values or the things to which you attach to, uh, are properly evaluated. That's what, that's very hard, but that's what they, they go for. So they want a certain kind of calm, equable, but good set of emotions properly attached to things in the world, including your children, including your friends, including your country. Um, it's just that when things go south, you will somehow figure out a way of rebalancing a little bit, you might say. They also are cosmopolitans. That is where we get the term. And they do believe that there is a way in which you can both reach out, I'll use the phrase across the aisle, but they would say across to outer circles so that you bring the outer to most circle inward. Here's Heracles. It's not the Heracles we think of as a Hercules, but a very lesser known guy 
whose name begins with an H, Hierocles, he says, you're at the center. Imagine concentric circles going outward, extending to the farthest reach. Your task is to bring the outermost circle inward so that the outermost person becomes kith and kin. The, fra the, the Romans, uh, excuse me, the Stoics have a phrase for this. It's called oikiosis, bringing home, bring, making familiar, uh, making a kin. And so the political task for progress is to try not to be narrow-minded, I'd say. <laughs> try to break down silos. Try to f work in cooperative endeavors so that people that seem rather other aren't so other. They use the phrase all the time, bring home the outermost person to the center so they are more like kith and kin. And do it, says Her Heracles, with respect and zeal. So I take it that's a moral commitment. I take it that's what Kant was talking about in saying, we have duties to try to create the commonwealth of ends in this world. And that will be the moral commonwealth. Thank you for listening. If you enjoy Free Thoughts, make sure to rate and review us in Apple Podcasts or in your favorite podcast app. Free Thoughts is produced by Landry Ayers. If you'd like to learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.